We are at chapter 18 of the Bhagavad Gita and as I previously announced that this is the second last session and from this session onwards which is session number 39 of the Bhagavad Gita we start the grand overview we summarize the entire Bhagavad Gita so far mostly this is happening in the last chapter itself. It has been summarized in the last chapter. But we will also look at it from our perspective, from a, to get a big picture of the text. How the text is taking us through the entire internal journey. Imagine if you were the seeker. Arjun, how the teacher, Krishna, takes you through the entire journey. A very fascinating text. I have often wondered whether the authors really analyzed it and planned it or whether it intuitively sort of fell into place. This Last chapter covers in the following sessions, uh, sorry, following verses, a quick uh, summary of instructions. It brings with it an assurance, a warning, cautionary remarks, and it brings us to the aspect of nadatavyam that is do not impart this to those who are not ready it talks about the ideal listener those of you who have been attending regularly or catching up on the channel know and i have mentioned this often that the last few chapters have repeatedly talked about the gunas sattva rajas and tamas that was in chapter 14 chapter 16 chapter 17 and even part of chapter 18 we talked about the gunas those of us who understand the tattvas the elements the yogic elements know that the most basic Gross elements are earth, water, fire, air and space. And out of these elements, all the things that you see around you are made up of. And these are called the Bhutas. Now, that's at the most gross level. Then comes a finer, slightly finer aspect, and that is how we perceive these elements. We perceive this through our cognitive senses. And through these cognitive senses, we experience smell, we experience taste, we experience sight, we hear sounds, and touch and these are connected to the five elements of course slightly subtler than this then are the antakarna itself the mind which is made up of manas which is interacting with the senses there is ahankara a sense of self-identity and there is buddhi the voice of wisdom within. And even beyond this, far subtler are the gunas. Everything is made up of the gunas. Rajas, Sattva and Tamas. So, if you see it from this perspective, you, you're talking about the finest, one of the finest aspects of the Tattvas. Yet, in the last 
few chapters, we're talking about the gunas and relating this to every aspect of our daily life. You see the gunas in everything around you. We spoke about the gunas referring to the types of happiness. We talked about the gunas in terms of the kinds of knowledge. We talked about the gunas with reference to our steadfastness or sankalpa. We even referred to buddhi in these three forms of gunas. We talked about action in this way. There are three types of action. There's rajasik, tamasik and sattvic action. We talked about sadhakas and practices. We talked about sattvic practices, rajasic practices and tamasic practices. So we see that the last chapters of the Bhagavad Gita connect that which is right at the top of the tattvas, you know, the finest elements, is related to that which is around the world, everything around us, including the Buddhas. And with that, the Bhagavad Gita makes us aware that we live in this world, the world is made up of gunas, they are ever-changing, we cannot escape them, we are always going to be living with this ever-changing, transient world around us. And this link of the finest with the most gross aspect this is the highest teaching of Sri Vidya. For a lot of people who do not understand what Sri Vidya is, they think Sri Vidya means worshipping the female deity, feminine energy. But what is feminine energy? Feminine energy is also known as Shakti, and Shakti means everything that I just mentioned in the tattvas, the bhutas, the active and the cognitive senses, the three aspects of the mind, manas, buddhi and ahankara, it includes the gunas, all this is shakti, all this is the female or feminine energy. So this is also a text of Sri Vidya. The words are not used anywhere, but those who practice and gain deep insights into this, understand this. And that is why this is considered to be one of the finest texts, because it doesn't tell you to escape life, run away from the world, go to the mountains, sit in a dark, wet, cold cave, it tells you that this is the playground of your desires, is the place where the battlefield is. This is the battlefield. It is not something esoteric. It is very, very practical and very, very real and useful. The verses 50 to 56 summarize uh, many of the uh, instructions and the journey and I will just read through these seven verses. Verses 50 to 56 How one, having attained perfection, attains Brahman, learn from me, as well as the final determination of knowledge, endowed with purified intelligence, controlling himself with sustenance, vritti, abandoning the objects of senses, such as sound, and casting away attraction and aversion, enjoying solitary places, eating lightly, 
with speech, body, and mind controlled, unceasingly intent on the yoga of meditation, having perfect recourse to this passion, having abandoned ego, pride, passion, and anger, not receiving sense inputs, free of mind and pacified one, is fit to become Brahman. Having become Brahman with pleasant and clear self, one neither grieves nor desires. Alike toward all beings, he gains the highest devotion towards me. Through devotion, he recognizes me, how expansive and who I am in reality. Then knowing me in reality, he enters me immediately. Even performing all the actions at all times, depending entirely on me, through my grace, he attains the eternal and imperishable state. These seven verses have summarized the entire journey. Who is the one who can attain perfection? The one who is fully determined to gain knowledge. That's the very first prerequisite. With purified intelligence, that's one having a sharp buddhi, controlling himself with driti or sustaining stamina, determination. That's the second prerequisite. Abandoning the objects of senses such as sound and casting away attraction and aversion. Such a person would not be unduly influenced by the objects of senses. Abandon here does not mean tiaga in the sense that you need to completely give them up, but you overcome attraction and aversion, which means vairagya. It is very clear that when you have acquired a certain sense of vairagya, your mind will not go towards those objects, those worldly objects. And then you don't need to do thiaga. When you do thiaga, you forcefully give up certain worldly objects. But your mind may still be craving for those objects. So you see, thiaga does not imply vairagya. But vairagya immediately implies that you will lose interest in most worldly objects. You will enjoy them if they are there and if they are not there, it doesn't matter. So these are the prerequisites. Pure, purified intelligence, ashabhuti, sankalp shakti, or determination and overcoming one's uh, attractions and aversions that is the sensory objects are not so dominant for the person he is looking for something deeper so these are the three main prerequisites and having these he would enjoy being alone spending time in meditation would not eat much, it's not greedy, enjoys eating light food, speech, mind, body is controlled. It does not mean that he is forcing himself not to talk or a forceful control of, of physical needs or desires. But here control means that these primitive urges are not that dominant in the person's life. Some of you may ask yourself, how is that possible? You, you seem to be always battling with these primitive urges and you ask yourself, how is it possible? To which I would say, think about a little child who likes to, who enjoys playing with building blocks, 
with cars, with dolls, with uh, you know soft toys. By the time these children become teenagers, they do not want to be caught dead with any of those things. Which teenager wants to be seen with a cuddly toy? None of them, right? So that is almost a sense of aversion. Then as you grow up, still older, you do not have an aversion towards cuddly toys. You find them cute. But obviously, as an adult of maybe 25 or 30, you're not going to play with cuddly toys. So you let that go. It dropped, it dropped away. You grew out of that. Similarly, you grow out of many worldly desires as well. So when the body and the mind is a little more mature, is keen on meditation and one has worked a little bit with meditation to abandon egotistical tendencies which come from ahankara, passion, anger, this feeling of mine. Such a person is now fit to attain the highest state, to become one with the universal self. And when this starts happening, such a person goes beyond the dualities. He, he has a glimpse of that higher state. And going beyond these dualities, he, he acquires a, a bhava, a beautiful devotion, a, a love for the divine. And this love leads him, pulls him. It's like magnetism or like gravity. It has, it's, an, it's an attractive force that pulls you and it pulls you towards this divinity which is within and you expand into it. That's why it says you, you enter into it, you expand into it and this does not mean that you give up your actions. It means that if you are still embodied, you will continue to live in the world. Performing actions at all times, but remaining established in that beautiful divinity. In these seven verses, the entire journey summarized. Any thoughts, any questions, any comments, any doubts? You're most welcome to use the chat or if you want to say something, you can just speak. Okay, everybody seems to be content. So... We move to the next two verses. These two verses give us an assurance and a warning. Sri Krishna says, verses 57 and 58, Renouncing all acts to me, the mind intent upon me, resorting to the yoga of wisdom, always hold your mind in me. Holding your mind in me, you will go across difficult passages through my grace. If, however, out of ego, you will not listen, you will perish completely. Now, this is a warning to those who are on the path of meditation. When, it's, when I say on the path of meditation, I don't mean those who are trying to intellectually understand the Bhagavad Gita. What is meant is those who have begun to work on their self-development. One of the first things you required, it was mentioned there in verse 50 was, or in verse 56 was, Shabbuddhi, 
abandoning of the objects of senses, having some sankalp shakti. So somebody who is doing some deeper practice, who is making change in his life and his lifestyle, in his attitudes to the world around him. Often one sees people who are doing an intellectual study of scriptures, that if you see their life, there has been no change, absolutely none whatsoever. And this means that the person is only working at a very superficial intellectual level. But for those who start the meditation, who start on this path, start working with themselves, totally focused, resorting to the wisdom that is buddhi and holding on to that, when they start on this journey, they begin to see the conflicts in the mind. They experience the battle in the mind that Arjun was experiencing. The two battlefields in front of him. These are his own mind. The good and the evil. The knowledgeable and the ignorant part in his own mind. These are the dualities within and as you proceed on the path, these dualities seem to become actually more and more exaggerated, more difficult. You see more. The more you see, the harder it seems to get. The struggle, the battle becomes very difficult, reaches a peak, a climax. But if you go through these difficult passages in your practice, you will succeed through grace, through the grace of divine. Those who are genuine seekers, who are ready to go on this battle, this inner battle, they will succeed. They may experience a great deal of fear. And when there is fear, know that you are coming closer and closer. You are beginning to cut down the ego. You are beginning to work with your unacceptable qualities, beginning to work with deep transformation of yourself, not a superficial mask that you put on top of yourself where you pretend to be holy, but by purifying your negativities, what is left, the beautiful part is left, because the ugly part has been killed, that is why Arjun is a warrior, he kills these evil thoughts in him. And when that is destroyed, what is left? The good is left behind. The beautiful is left behind. And so grace will come if you have courage to go through that. But if you do not, and you give in to ego, if you do not continue your journey, you give in to the sweet seductions of ego, which tells you, oh, you don't need to fight this battle. You are already fine. You are already perfect. You are already a great guy. You will not listen, then you will perish. And what does it mean to perish? You remain in darkness and ignorance. So it brings a reassurance that you will go through difficult phases in practice. And grace will come to you if you are a genuine seeker, if you are brave, courageous, and you go through this inner battle. And it brings with it a warning that if you do not continue, you will get stuck, you will give in to ego, you will fall into deep ignorance. And then who knows how many more lifetimes it will take for you to get out of that darkness. So, would anybody like to ask anything regarding these two verses or the previous verses? Okay, 
everybody seems to be fine. We continue with the next two verses. Verses 59 and 60. If resorting to ego, you think, I shall not fight this. I shall not fight this. Your resolve is a false one. Nature will impel you. Bound by your nature-born act, O son of Kunti, what you do not wish to do out of confusion, even that you will do helplessly. So what will happen if you do not fight this battle? This battle, where Arjun is standing there at the battlefield, very discouraged and uh, um, depressed, he is asking Shri Krishna for advice and guidance. This is the battlefield of the mind. This is a seeker who has seen that the mind is full, is always wavering. There is good and there is bad. There is dark, there is light. There is evil and ignorance and there is good and there is knowledge. So, going back and forth all the time, he is fed up and he's discouraged. He can't fight anymore. He's so fed up. He says, oh, I want to give up. I, I do not want to fight. And then, the ego even says, oh, I do not want to fight because I don't want to kill my enemies. These are my relatives. That is indeed true because these, this ignorance is a part of you. It's a part of your nature. So, if you resort to ego, this is a false resolve. And your nature, this tamasic aspect, that will lead you into confusion. So even if a part of you says, I do not wish to do this, this is wrong, you will still do that. You will end up in misery. These are actually cowards. These are people who have given up the battle and they're weak, they do not have the Sankalp Shakti, they, they are not able to continue that fight. The doubts take over and they give in to these doubts. They become weak and it is a form of cowardice. It is a cowardly action. You stop fighting. You fall into deep ignorance and in that deep ignorance you do things which are ignorant, which are wrong, which are evil, which are tamasic. Even though that part of you, a small little part of you knows this is not right. But you are so helplessly lost there that you cannot fight against this anymore. Um, there is somebody, a uh, Purshottam, there is a lot of background noise, so I, I'm going to have to mute you. Yes, I muted you because that was causing a lot of background noise. And so, if you would like to say something, you can use the chat. If you have a question, you can use the chat. So this is what it means to lose the the battle, the inner battle, to give up is the act of cowardice and you give up and, and this leads you to fall into the darkness of tamas and you will do things even though you don't want to do them. You will do evil, ignorant things even though you know, a part of you knows that this is wrong and that part that knows it, that's buddhi and that part which knows that this is wrong has become so weak, it's become so powerless that there's nothing it can do. It becomes a silent observer to all the evil around. And that was a bit like what happened to 
the father of the hundred cousins, the evil cousins, the father was blind. He was blind. It means that he was so ignorant and he, he had no control over this and he was just a, a silent witness to all their evil doings. Though he knew it was wrong, he could not do anything to stop it. So that is a sign or a symbol of a tamasic buddhi. Okay, any questions about that? <clears throat> no? No questions? Good. Verses 61 and 263. The sovereign God dwells in the heart space of all beings. O Arjuna, making all beings move with his maya as though they were mounted on a machine. Go and seek refuge only in him with your entire being. O descendant of Bharata. By his grace, you will attain the highest peace and eternal station. I have taught you this knowledge, more secret than any secret. After contemplating it in entirety, do as you wish. Who is that sovereign God that dwells in the heart space of all beings? That is pure consciousness. The heart space is also the seat of deep emotions. It is also the seat of the unconscious mind. Buried within the unconscious mind or what is known as the Jivatman, Pure consciousness uses the Jivatman as a vehicle. And the Jivatman is basically made up of all samskaras and deep vasanas. These are like seeds. What are samskaras? Samskaras are all your action leave a certain impression behind in your mind. If you perform any action, you say something, you do something, you receive certain information, all this is stored in your mind as impressions. These are samskaras. And what is the difference between samskara and vasana? Not much. Only difference is that vasanas are much deeper. They are ancient. So, they may not have a, a direct cause and uh, cause and effect to something, but they're more diffuse, they're more vague. These are very deep and these are called vasanas. You may have vasanas from another life or of, of animal life and you have had a animal life that leaves behind vasanas. Both of them, samskaras as well as vasanas, are nothing other than seeds. These are seeds which come forward in the form of further action. Buried deep inside this is the divine. And it makes all things move. There, everything that happens around is happening because of this.
pure consciousness that is deep inside us. And it's not just deep inside us, it's everywhere around us as well. And all things move in this maya, it's all energy, it's all consciousness. So he says, Sri Krishna says, take refuge in him, the entire being, go within. He doesn't say go out, he says go within, in the heart space or deep within. And by grace you will attain the highest. This is the secret, more secret than any other secret. And one should contemplate on it. But some of you may say, oh, what's so secret about this? I have read this before in some other book or I heard it before. What's the secret? Well, that is really something very interesting is that secret or gupt or rahasya the word secret is used sometimes but a much better word would be mystery it's a mystery more mysterious than any mystery and I like the word mystery much more than secret secret seems to imply if I tell you something we keep it between us it's a secret but mystery is something that we all struggle to understand. Life and death is a mystery. We do not really understand it. And that is what this verse is talking about. When you go within, these mysteries are all resolved. This mystery is revealed to you. It's no longer a mystery then. And you contemplate on it and you know it in its entirety. You know the mysteries of life and death. Okay. Thus, it becomes clear that to know this mystery, you need to know yourself. The self that is concealed within the unconscious mind, buried inside. The greatest treasure is buried inside. Okay. Any questions about this? Radhika Banerjee. Mm -hmm. Yes, Banerjee. In the process of uh, going within, uh, one has to face the samskaras and uh, vasanas. So one has to eliminate this too to know with no further, or uh, how is this? Uh... Yes, yes, of course. That's what it means. That's what purification means. That these vasanas, these samskaras, imagine a mirror covered with dust, and you cannot see yourself. So these samskaras are clouding your vision. You cannot see through. So you need to purify yourself. It doesn't mean that you have to clean up completely, complete purification. What it can uh, mean also is that you need to purify to a certain extent so that you get a glimpse at least of your true nature. When you have that glimpse of the true nature, you immediately long for that again and again. And when that happens, that force of attraction comes into play. Until you've not had that glimpse of that beauty, even that smallest glimpse is always a struggle. Then there's no force of attraction that's pulling you. But once you've had this little glimpse, imagine you're polishing that mirror a little bit and you see a little glimpse of yourself. Then you long to see that, 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 that beauty again. And that longing is like gravity or like magnetism. It pulls you. 
and then it becomes easier. Because until then, the purification process must continue, and that's hard work. Which is why a lot of people give up. A lot of people say, this is ugly stuff that I have to go through. I have to keep fighting this battle. This battle is what Arjuna is going through. These evil thoughts, these are the evil cousins. Now there are a hundred cousins. They outnumber the good part. So it seems like such a one-sided battle. But it is not a hopeless battle. You just need to have a glimpse. And then the rest is grace. Then you are pulled. But these samskaras, that process of purification must start. If it does not start, then you are stuck. Um, Purushottam, you can write uh, questions to all in the group because sometimes it happens that I, I don't see uh, a comment that you write directly to the presenter uh, or to the organizer. So, your question is how to purify the samskaras. Well, <laughs> that's a very difficult question to answer on this platform, because that is generally the subject of our retreats, uh, subject of our um, satsangs, and those who are closer students, they learn the systematic method of meditation and how to purify the samskaras. So, if you have no teacher, or if you have not done any work in that area, then the best way to start is through prayer. When I say prayer, I don't mean prayer to an external deity, but I mean prayer to the one within, to the divinity within. Most importantly, in your own words. You ask for guidance, you ask for help in your own words. You formulate what it is that you want. If you are looking to attain that highest state, to go beyond suffering, then express this to the divine in your own words. And the prayer will be heard. When the prayer is said deep inside, with bhava, with devotion, it's always heard. When it is spontaneous, natural, and it rises on its own, it will be heard. That's why one also says, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. What it means is, when there is a deep desire in you, you will find guidance. So, how to purify yourself, that guidance will come to you if you start strengthening that longing within you through deep prayer. Prayer which is in your own words. It's very important that you do not use ready-made prayers because then you are just repeating them like a parrot. Rather, a prayer in your own words from within is like a baby talking to the mother. Baby speaks in very sweet words. They're not even words. They're just babble. It doesn't make any sense. But the mother understands because that's the language of love. So nobody should create or prepare a prayer for you. That prayer should come from the heart, from deep within. And that's how one starts. Okay. Balaji, was that clear for you? Okay, I presume it was clear. We go to verses 
64 to 66. Again, hear my final words, the most secret of all. You are firmly my favorite. Therefore, I shall say what is beneficial to you. Let your mind be in me, my devotee, sacrificing to me. Offer salutations to me. You will come only to me. Truly, I avow you are my beloved, abandoning all virtue. Come and take refuge in me alone. I shall liberate you from all evil. Grief not. Once again, Sri Krishna speaks of the, the most secret of secrets and says, I will say that to you because you are my favorite. The word favorite is a matter of translation. Some translations say, you are my dear one, you are my dear student, so I shall say what is beneficial to you. All wise teachers, all good teachers, are only interested in the student's welfare. They will only say that which is beneficial. They will not say that which is not beneficial. We have spoken about the difference between Shreyas and Prayas. Shreyas is that which is good. Prayas is that which is pleasurable. Shreyas can be considered to be like medicine. Maybe bitter, but it's good for you. And prayers is like wine. Tastes good, wonderful, or honey tastes very good, but you can't have too much of it. It's not going to benefit you. And so it is with a teacher. A teacher is only interested in your benefit. But the student does not always want to hear that which is beneficial. Sometimes the students want to remain in their bad habits and they get very angry, upset, and disappointed when the teacher points out certain things to them. These deep unconscious habit patterns are not changed, then you will not benefit. So that medicine, which is what the teacher is going to tell you, that honest, truthful guidance, can be very, very hard to accept. Will the teacher give such guidance to students that are not ready? Obviously not. The student has to be of that caliber, like Arjun, who is ready to start the battle. He's, he's there, he's discouraged, he's, he requires some encouragement, but he is very brave. He is one of the bravest, and most courageous of all the warriors. So, we need a student who is like Arjun, who is ready to start that battle. Such a one is ready to face that, those parts in him, and he is listening to the guidance of his teacher, who will explain to him how to unroot these deep habit patterns, which are harming you, which are causing a lot of suffering. So, what does one do if the student is not ready? If the student doesn't want to see himself, doesn't want to see the good as well as the bad aspects of himself, if he cannot see that there is a part in him that is 
knowledgeable, good, and the other part is evil, ignorant. If he's not willing to see that, how can a teacher help such a student? The teacher cannot. You cannot force such a student. You cannot push such a student. Because a student that is not ready to fight this battle will always just give up. Just give up in different forms. They will maybe even be angry at the teacher. Or they go away. They just stop. They don't want to meet the teacher again. And this is very natural because changing these deep unconscious habit patterns is the most difficult thing in the world. It is therefore considered to be the greatest battle, the greatest war that is ever fought. It's the internal battle. So think of it as a teacher that you knew from your school. Maybe the teacher in your school or college also had some favorites or some students were more dear to that teacher. A good teacher will try not to have favorites, but those who are willing to learn, those who ask good questions, they want to learn, they're eager to know things. They're very present in the class. They're active, they, they, they take initiative, they do a lot of extra work, they get involved in different projects. You may have seen some students when you were young in your class, maybe you were one of them. And such a student is always, the teacher likes such students. It doesn't mean that the teacher doesn't take care of the other students. The other students are helped in a different way. A wise mother or a wise parent, how does he handle different children? Some children may be very independent, may be very smart. And the other child, the second child, the third child, maybe he's weak, maybe he's sick, maybe he's uh, uh, slow. The parent deals with this second child in a different way. The one who is stronger and more independent, the parent says, okay, go ahead, do, do what you're doing. Be independent, wonderful. And the one who is weak, the parent gives more support, more time, more attention, more love. And so it is with the teacher as well. It's not like the teacher has favorites. But if a student is not ready for this internal battle, the student cannot be forced into it. You can slowly explain and convince the student, but you cannot push him into this. And so the student that is ready, who is ready for this battle, he is the one who is very dear because he is the one who is listening. He is the one who is putting those things into practice. He is the reason the teacher is there. Teacher is there for those who really want to do this. And for those who don't want to do it, the teacher has to be very patient and wait. So this is how the teacher works with the Student, always working for the benefit of the student. You will see for yourself if you have a teacher, that if the teacher says something that is benefiting you and if you don't like it, remember this, that it's like medicine. Only the most courageous of Students are ready for such guidance. The others, they like to go to teachers who are flattering you. They organize nice social meetings. They sing songs. This is all nice. Maybe also inspiring. 
But this is not preparation for the inner battle. Preparation for the inner battle involves looking brutally at yourself in that mirror which is being polished and getting guidance from the teacher who is going to help you polish that mirror, help you purify. That is basically changing your samskaras, changing your karma. It means you become the master of your own life. That's what the word Swami means, master of the self. In the true sense of the word, Swami is not one who renounces and wears saffron garb, but Swami is the one who is master of the self, the one who has purified himself and is guiding his own future by working on his samskaras and sharpening his buddhi. Only such a one can go against destiny, against the flow of your innate nature and takes you deep within. All right. Questions? Comments about these three verses? These three verses are quite important in the sense that we should understand the teacher-student relationship. For thousands of years, this relationship was very sacred. Unfortunately, in the last 50 to 60 years, this relationship has not only become trivialized, it has been also attacked by people. There are people who say that the gurus are trying to manipulate you, they are evil, they, they, they only want your money, which may also be true. They are black sheep. But a good teacher is not trying to take away your money or hypnotize you, make you into a sort of a slave. Quite the opposite. A good, wise teacher wants to make you completely independent and free even of your own deep, rooted habit patterns called samskaras. So when you take refuge in these teachings and when you go deeper then you are liberated. Without working on the unconscious mind and purifying oneself, one cannot liberate oneself. Yes, Suravi, you wanted to say something? Uh, yeah, yeah, Radhikaji. Uh, I wanted to ask that uh, these unconscious uh, habit pattern which we have, are they also related with uh, the four primitive fountains? And if uh, by regulating some of these primitive fountains, can we uh, unwind this unconscious habit pattern? Yes. The unconscious mind, uh, of course, these uh, primitive fountains, which are... Um, sexuality, food, sleep, and self-preservation. They are very deep, and one cannot immediately work on these um, in the sense of uh, pulling them out from the roots itself. So one begins by regulating them. And so if you think of our analogy of the mirror, the mirror is still covered with dust, but now you started cleaning it a little bit and maybe by regulating your primitive fountains, you are able to get a little glimpse. But to have a fully polished mirror, that means to have the highest state of meditation where the entire unconscious mind comes forward and is burned. All the seeds are burnt, the samskaras are burnt, they lose completely their power over you. And you become a witness. So that stage, of course, comes eventually. One begins with the regulation of these four primitive urges or the four fountains. And that's a, a very important aspect of beginning this process. So to Purushottam who had asked this question, um, purification, 
uh, one way is through prayer and the other way is to establish a, a Vedic lifestyle, to work on one's regulation of food habits, eating sattvic food, eating at regular times, regulating sleeping habits, no, not having unhealthy habits, but waking up early, going to bed early. These kind of disciplined life helps a great deal. We have seen that those who are not able to maintain a disciplined life, they struggle greatly and though many of them believe that they can continue to meditate and attain something in meditation without leading a disciplined life, we have seen through experience that that does not really work. That is not sustainable, that option. Sooner or later, there is again this fall into, you know, this, this kind of confusion and ignorance and, and all the, the fountains become very active and so this disciplined lifestyle is the first, one of the first steps. And it's a very, very important aspect. Thank you for bringing that up, Suravi. That's very good. Thank you. Okay, so it's um, one hour is over. And um, I just wanted to remind everybody that the last session... That's next Friday is the very last session of the Bhagavad Gita. We have been doing this for one year now. Uh, last session next Friday will be the 40th session. For those of you who may have missed a session, you can catch up. It's all on the channel. So all next Friday, all the 40 uh, sessions will be on the channel. And so... The entire Bhagavad Gita with commentary will be available. And after we have completed the Bhagavad Gita, we take a break for one week. And that's Good Friday. A lot of people have a holiday then. So we take a break then. And on the 21st of um, April, we start with the Mandukya Upanishad. The Mandukya Upanishad, a very, very important text of our tradition will then uh, give us deep insights into the nature of consciousness, the three states of consciousness and the fourth that is beyond. A very important text for those who really aspire to attain the highest. Okay, so I hope you all have a nice weekend and um, see you next Friday. Bye bye everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye everybody. Bye Kadigaji. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye Miklosh. Bye Pushatam. Bye Survi. Bye. Bye Vinu. Bye. Bye Radhika. Bye. Bye, Stephanie.